Hello, everyone, um, and welcome to the IDA screening series. Uh, this is a conversation uh, around Netflix's Athlete A. We're very excited. Uh, before uh, I get started, uh, I just wanted to introduce myself. My name is Cassidy Diamond, and I am the Public Programs and Events Manager here at the International Documentary Association. Um, I'm coming to you today uh, on the land uh, of the Tongva and Chumash people um, who have been stewards of this land for generations. Uh, this is unceded land, uh, but is currently known as Los Angeles. Um, I'd like to give a shout out to our media sponsor, IndieWire. Um, thank you for coming on to help us bring screening series to all of you. And also uh, could not do it without support of KCRW. And just in case you're hopping on for the first time, you can find more information about how to watch all of these films as an IDA member and join these conversations, even if you're not an IDA member, at documentary.org slash screening series. And before we go any further, I want to bring on our moderator. We have Variety's Jazz Tanke here. Hi, Jazz. Hi, Welcome. Cassidy. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm really excited to be here today. Um, as Cassidy said, I'm Jazz Tanke, Artisans Editor at Variety. Thank you to the IDA and everybody tuning in. Um, I'm really excited to dive into this conversation today with filmmakers Bonnie Cohen and John Shank. Um, they've worked on documentaries such as An Inconvenient Truth, Audrey and Daisy, which is streaming on Netflix, and their most recent project, Athlete A, which is also streaming on Netflix. So without further ado, let me say hello to Bonnie and John. Hello. Hello. Yes. <laughs> nice to see you. Nice to see you both. Wow, we have a lot to talk about today. Um, first of all, congratulations on this incredible, powerful story that you have brought to light with Athlete A. Um, before we go into it, how much, how aware were you of this complex and toxic web that existed within the world of gymnastics? Like, what did you know? Mm. That's a good question. Um, not as much as we should have. Uh, when we were first approached by Jen Say, who was the 1986 US champion, she, we collaborated with her on this project. Uh, she wrote the book Chalked Up in 2008. Um, what we knew at the time was we knew about the Larry Nassar scandal, but we didn't know how deep the corruption went and how deep the abuses went until we started talking with Jen and the folks that she brought in to work with us on the film. Um, and this web of corruption and abuse that went back decades and decades inside of USA Gymnastics, all the way up to the US Olympic Committee, et cetera. Um, we, we got exposed to it through the research around the film and it was just shocking and disturbing um and we we were gripped we knew we had a we knew we had to make the film yeah how did you how did you actually get to meet jennifer and at what point was it like you know we're gonna make this film like where did that conversation yeah again jen had um he she had been in this world for a long long time she was a a gymnast, gymnastic champion, national champion, and um, she had been very concerned um, ever since she was a child about the culture of abuse that existed in gymnastics. She had she saw Audrey and Daisy um, in 2016 um, around the same time. She was thinking that uh, you know a, a documentary would be really um, potentially really incredible about this topic, and then the Nasser uh, scandal broke. And she actively started looking for filmmakers, got in touch with us, us through a common friend, Julie Parker Bonello, who ended up being a producer on the film. And so we 
we started talking in uh, mid-17 um, as the Nasser story was kind of unfolding and the Indianapolis Star was still uh, kind of in the middle of, the, of their sort of peak reporting on the, on the topic. Wow. And I mean, at what point do you, you know, what was the story going to be initially? Like, what was that first approach? Because, and then I guess at what point did you realize, wow, we've taken off on like, you know, a, a blue whale of a story here? We really were, yeah, it, it is a blue whale and there is so much left on the cutting room floor. We had a lot of discussions about whether or not the film should become a series and how far back in the history and how in depth we should go. But, you know, what we wanted to make sure to do in the film and what we were originally taken by to your question was the investigative reporting at the Indy Star. Um, it's, it's an incredible, an incredibly important story of, you know, investigative reporters, not at the New York Times or the Washington Post, but in the city of Indianapolis, you know, working at a fairly small organization, um, trying to scrape together dollars for every investigative piece that they do. And they kind of got a tiger by the tail as they looked into not the Nasser story, but they got a tip on a coach in Georgia who um, had been abusing young girls down there. And through the discovery and the investigation, they uncovered a policy that had existed inside USA Gymnastics that they did not report abuse um, or look into abuse unless it was reported to them by an eyewitness to that abuse the actual gymnasts themselves or their parent. Now, you know, we're talking about little kids and that's not likely to be a reporter of, of sexual abuse or any kind of abuse. So they exposed this incredible policy, uh, this crazy policy inside of USA Gymnastics. And through that story and the publishing of that story, these women from around the country who did not know each other, Jamie Dancher, who was a 2000 Olympian, Rachel Denhollander, who was a gymnast in Michigan, and um, Jessica Howard, who was an uh, acrobatic uh, gymnast, they called in to the Indy Star having read their reporting and said, you know, the story that you report about this coach, it's uh, something very similar happened to me, but it was at the hand of this doctor who was working on our team at the time, or I went to see him as an osteopath, whatever their story was. And these investigative reporters started to piece together that these women didn't know each other, but they had the same story to tell. And through their tenacity, they started to expose Larry Nasser. Um, so John and I were really taken with that. We were really taken with the work of those reporters, invest the, the importance of investigative journalism and bring in, you know, bringing truth to power and the bravery of these women. So we wanted to marry the investigative reporting and, and how important that is with the bravery and the voices of these survivors. So that, that, was, the, that was the goal for us. Yeah, and I mean, the, the film deals with, you know, such a sensitive conversation. You're dealing with sexual abuse how do you approach, you know, and you've done it, you know, you did it with Audrey and Daisy. How do you approach the, you know, the women to have them, you know, retell this trauma? They, you know, they've been reliving that, um, but making them feel safe. I mean, you know, you've such a knack for doing that in your films, but. You know, yeah, yeah that's a good question. We, we um, to tell you the truth, um, of course, like from Audrey, making Audrey and Daisy, we, we, we uh, had advisors telling us, you know, advising us to be very careful to tread lightly. Obviously, there's a kind of a whole um, expertise in how to, how to talk to a survivor of trauma. Um, the last thing you want to do is re-traumatize in, in a way that could potentially injure somebody. Um, the interesting thing that Bonnie and I found in this case is that um, uh, was kind of a parsing of that idea. Um, you know, I, I think that survivors are traumatized when they tell their story and then they're not believed. But something of the opposite can happen. We found that when survivors tell their story and they are believed, um, something maybe akin to healing or part of the healing process. And so Bonnie and I went to 
the survivors that we knew were central to the, the story of Nasser kind of getting outed, so to speak. Um, and that and that's what we said to them. We said, you know, we said we'd like to sit down. We'd like you to be part of the story. We 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 uh, we know what you sa you're saying is true. It's been it's been backed up by many people. And and we sat down and, and we told them that we would also show them the pieces of the film that they were that their story comes up in. And we were surprised to learn that um, many of the survivors in the film they wanted the details in there because they wanted the world to know what they went through. Um, and once they had that confidence that the story would be told with that kind of believability factor, it was really I think empowering for them. It also it takes a while to get. Um... This doesn't the 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 telling when you, once you get to the telling of the story. I mean, it, we you put a lot of time and hours and meetings in with you know each of the people that are in the film. You want the you know you want to build trust. I mean, it sounds it sounds easy. It sounds simple like a simple thing, but um, you know we like to take a lot of time. We don't we don't rush. Mm -hmm storytelling um and you know we certainly have the experience where we've gotten somewhere and a certain person has not been ready and you'll have to come back and I, it's very meaningful to return it's very meaningful to come back more than once and be there um to hear the next part or to hear a new rendition of the story or, oh i wanted to add something on i forgot i wasn't feeling well i want to tell it this way you know that's the beauty of documentary you can hopefully you have the latitude and the time to go back in and and build that trust. One, one kind of cool detail along these lines is, of course, we stand on the shoulders of the indie star who, um, you know, did a lot of this early reporting and broke the story. Um, Mark Alicia, one of the reporters, went down to interview Rachel Denhollander and he took a video crew with him. Um, this is when she first reported her uh, uh, abuse by Nasser. And that footage is so intense. It's in the film. It's, you see her, she, mm -hmm. she lost weight. She clearly ha is undergoing a lot of stress, uh, you know, in the lead up to telling the story. And then of course we go back and interview her a couple of years later and she's become this incredible powerhouse of, uh, you know, of a leading voice, um, you know, in the, yeah. in the Me Too movement in general, not just yeah. in the gymnastics um, kind of anti Nasser movement. And she's thriving. She's, you know, she's, she's pregnant with her third child and she's leading this incredibly rich life. And so you can see the, literally in the film, the, 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 even the physical impacts that it has on, on these survivors once they get on a track to, to cut, you know, to healing and, and telling their story in a, in a constructive way. Yeah. And you were, John, you were the cinematographer, um, you know, in the dark, like, how did you, talk about like the cameras and how you wanted to frame the women especially you know as you said like you know rachel and she comes she comes across as you you sense that strength that she has so yeah talk about how you wanted to frame them especially like sometimes you know you're wide and then you go close like those choices <laughs> um, well, thank you for picking up on that. Um, yeah, Bonnie and I actually had a number of discussions about how we would film these um, interviews. It's kind of easy to, to a lot of people say, oh, that's a, that's a documentary that's based on talking heads, or that's a documentary that's based on cinema verite. And um, we, with this one, we really, of course, knew that we had to sit down and talk to people and interview them. But we we were actually a li somewhat inspired by other films that had um, at their core uh, difficult discussions with survivors. We we took a look at Spotlight, Tom McCarthy's great film on the on the Boston Globe reporters um, with the with the with the um, abuses that took place in the, the Catholic Church in Boston. Um, and we started to think of these interviews more as little scenes, you know, where we would have the camera, we would kind of show the, the space that this character, uh, so to speak, this person, you know, uh, inhabits, and then have the uh, luxury of being able to cut to different angles in that room. And also uh, making sure that the light was completely natural. Like we, right. we tried not to, we wanted to create, as John said, like a scene that had natural light. And they, it's as if we had just captured that in their, in the moment and they sat down and they started telling their their story rather than it looking set up and theatrical. Mm. Yeah. yeah. 
what was it like? I think, you know, the sad thing about the documentary is it really just shows how adults let them down. You know, it, it wasn't like, you know, they were trying, they, they had reported the abuse it was covered up like just as parents and human beings like what was that like having that unfold before your eyes mm. oh god I, it's so it's just so tragic to think about every all the things that the parents didn't know all of the ways in which they weren't led into what was going on in the gyms for example i mean we have this it's not in the film but um one of the most heartbreaking details that we filmed was an interview with Jen Say's mother, Merle Say, who was recounting stories from like the 70s when, you know, clearly weird stuff was happening. Like she was driving girls to the gym and some of them were like vomiting out the back of the car on the way. And she tried to talk to the coaches about it and they, they waved her off. And, you know, Jen really fell apart um, after she won the championship. She tried to go on with gymnastics and she just she had had it, her body had had it, she had had it psychologically. And her mother really fought with her at that time, you know, because the families have so much at stake. They have put all of these years into the this athlete, right? And so it's just, it's just very complicated psychologically and emotionally. And all these years later, you could see on Merle's face that she didn't have the relationship with her daughter that she wanted to have because this had kind of broken them. This had this had come between them and she had such guilt for what she didn't know about and, you know, tremendous anxiety about how Jen had processed that as an adult after she had been a gymnast, et cetera. So all to say, that's just an example of the, the, the real sadness that a lot of the adults who were trying to do the right thing um, were feeling in the wake of a lot of this exposure. It's just, it's, it's just very hard to reckon with. Yeah. When did you know, like, you know, you're getting these stories, like, to put the camera down or just keep filming? Mm. Like, that choice. We often just left it up to uh, the folks that we were with. I, I, I remember when um, we were filming Ray, uh, Jamie Dancher's mm -hmm. interview. That's um, what I was thinking of. Uh, she... Uh, she ha is incredibly brave and um, has worked with her lawyer, John Manley, to, to, to bring her grievances against USA Gymnastics and Larry Nasser. But um, she hasn't spoken publicly about it too much and, and, and it, because it's difficult for her. And um, we, we, we told her over the course of months that she would be in control of the conversation and, um, and checked in with her even as we were filming. And... Um, once she got going, she, you had the sense that it was difficult for her, but that she did want to, she did want to tell the story. And, um, once, once she kind of felt that it was in hands that she could trust. Um, but yeah, we mostly, I think, kind of take our cues from, from the people. As Bonnie said, this was really ultimately, I mean, ultimately this is, we felt like this was the survivor story to tell. Um, they really, the, the three core women, uh, Jamie, Jessica, and Rachel stepped up. And then of course, Maggie's story, which has a slightly different timeline, but is integrated into the story is uh, just incredibly dramatic. And Maggie's in the Nichols family to tell. And, and that was really our attitude all along that they, they had to believe in it um, as much if, if more than, than we did. Yeah. You know, wild too, is that, you know, John often talks about this, um, but I'll talk about it. Um, there are so many women, uh, who were Nasser survivors were things that happened to them like 20 years ago, you know, as far back as 20 years ago, all the way up to the present. And what we kind of saw, there were, there were girls who um, had been abused by Nasser during the period of time between when Maggie reported to USA Gymnastics and when they did anything about it. So we met those girls who had, been abused by Nasser as recently as while we were making the film, wow. all the way back to you know the late '90s, early 2000, which would have been Jamie's era, and the women who the women who um, had been abused early back, you know, way back, 
had not had as much, who, who hadn't had any process around it. Like they hadn't been able to talk to their parents about it. They didn't have a lawyer fighting on their behalf. There was no public admission of it happening. It had gone on into their you know, adult lives with any rec without any reckoning. Um, they were having a really, really tough time um, psychologically. And this, I don't mean to generalize, but it, we, what we notice is that some of the, some of the girls who had been abused more recently and who had been, who had come out to their parents, who had come out to a coach, who had been able to talk to a lawyer, were able to come out publicly um, and been believed, we could really see the difference in how they were faring, right, with their lives. Yeah. Yeah, for example, we met a we met a 16 year old girl who had been, she must have, her abuse must have taken place literally months before we met her, but she was already um, you know had the, the the strength to talk about it, the language to talk about it. Her parents knew about it. She had a she had a legal counsel. She had right. a therapist that she was talking to. Um, the media was interested in talking to her, and her strength was incredible. I mean, it was the yeah. resilience was amazing. I think, and, you know, versus somebody who had spent decades not being believed, being told, right. being gaslit in this way, you know, that, oh, that, that must be a misunderstanding. This is a great doctor. You know, he, he was just trying to help you, that kind of thing, um, which we saw the damage of that decades later. Yeah. I mean, early on in the doc, you've got Stephen Penny, like, in his, you know, de deposition, like, saying, like, you know, how, how, he, how they handled the sexual uh, misconduct and the and the complaint simply by dismissing them like that's you know talk about the archive footage because it is incredible you've got videotapes yeah i mean how far back did you go and talk about working with your archive team to get everything you need to tell the story yeah we you know we were making this film at a time when I think the consciousness about kind of systemic problems in American institutions were kind of coming into consciousness, like think, thinking about how we're, we're all kind of actors in these, in these systems, which in some way control uh, fate or, you know, our fate as Americans. And um, one thing we realized is right away is that this story, the, the story of, abusive culture in gymnastics went back decades and um, we felt like we had to tell to sort of do a, uh, a rabbit hole dive in the middle of the film back into history to tell the story about how this came to be um, and our producer Saren Marshall uh, is a uh, Kind of sort of a self-described um, ar archival film nerd. She just loves these kinds of uh, challenges and we worked uh, with Atlas Films um, which is uh, run Rich. by this guy, Rich Remsburg, who's um, documentary filmmakers will, will know who I'm talking about. He's just an incredible archive archivist and um, literally had us doing eBay searches for personal collections that people had of the Olympics going back to the 1960s to find archival film. And we had people in our office screening those things, looking for particular things and just found incredible gems, including of, of the main uh, characters in the film. Going back into the Romanian archives looking wow. for early Bella and Marta when they were training Nadia Comaneci as a six-year-old, you know, just all yeah. this communist footage from the communist era. Is Finding the needle in the haystack of, of uh, you know, the commentator commenting on Larry Nasser as a, as a 30 year old doctor when he first started to work for USA gymnastics at the Olympics. So we found an amazing um, archive and um, we were, we were really just thrilled to be able to, to weave that story together to show how gymnastics went from being a women's sport, uh, for example, in the in the 50s to being a sport for little girls in the 1970s after Nadia Comaneci's uh, uh, gold medal at the Montreal Games in 76. And then of course, sponsorship dollars entered the sport in the United States in the 1980s. And that really completely changed the system um, and the priorities of the organization um, kind of away from the well-being of athletes towards the well-being of the financial financial uh, health of these organizations like USA Gymnastics, which was now obsessed with keeping their sponsors happy more than they were with with the health of the athletes. So, yeah, we were we were quite excited to do that deep dive. Bonnie talked about how the how at one point we were thinking about turning this into a series, and it really it really mm -hmm. could have been at some level just to you know the, it's endlessly fascinating. We're big fans of of athletics, so to, to go back and watch these amazing athletes over time was just kind of a, 
a, you know, an amazing opportunity. But to, to tell that story was really um, just an just a, a amazing opportunity as filmmakers. I also want to just call out um, our editor, or really our other partner, Don Bernier, who um, we've cut a bunch of films with, but the work he did, I mean, the structural work, you know, this was a structural bear because, of, you know, you have to sort of think about when, when does the history need to come alive so that you have your bearings going into the contemporary stories. And then of course there's Maggie's timeline and then there's the timeline of the indie right. star. And um, Don is just, he did just it in our minds. He just did an incredible job of helping us structure um, those timelines, but also really kind of mastering the use of the archives so that he could kind of bring to life these periods of time, immerse you in them such that when you then go into the contemporary story, you have knowledge of what, you know, what gymnastics was like in the 70s and 80s and such. And um, yeah, so it was, it was really, we had a wonderful collaborative team who um, who helped put together this really hard film structure. <laughs> I love that. And as you said, you know, this is the third time you've worked with Don. Like how early did he come in to the process? Or... Oh, really? <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, we, we, you know, whenever we even start shooting a film these days, we start thinking about uh, the editing team because um, it's so mm -hmm. important and you know it's really such a core creative uh member of the team and really it's not just editing it's it's storytelling and writing and um structuring the story he's incredible um, with music like yeah. just incredible with music yeah um i think we brought him in while we were we've done this on the last two films with don we brought him in while we're still shooting um so that he and we also we we even even prior to Don to get ready for Don, we also worked with David Teague, to um, who's another wonderful editor, to kind of sort of get some story sense of the different narratives, such that when Don began, we could have some at least some structural signposts for uh, how we were going to run the film. And um, uh, so we we have found that we're bringing in editors earlier and earlier. Don. Don was in before we even had shot much with Maggie. Wow. You know, we had just shot with, with Jamie and Rachel and we're just starting to shoot with Maggie. Excuse yeah. How many passes did you do with, with the film and with Don? Um, because I can't imagine as you, like how many hours you had between the archive, the interviews, you know, the indie star, you know, you know the, the legal team like you've hit it so many i we lost too many to we, count we lost track <laughs> uh, i mean the, you know the the um we don't want to sound like we invented the wheel of course almost every documentary probably has a story uh about uh, struggling with structure um the this this story really challenged us um in terms of kind of a timeline type way. There were so many different timelines. There was a historical timeline of just kind of what's happened in history and what I laid out earlier. Um, there was this, the timeline of the Indianapolis Star and their reporting, you know, they, they kind of had this um, lead and they started pulling at a, at a thread um, and that led them to have a certain understanding over time. And of course we were telling their story, we were shooting Verite film, it, Verite footage in the newsroom with them so that was a timeline. And then um, Maggie Nichols uh, story is kind of a contemporary timeline, but not really because her story predated the Indianapolis Star because she had reported Nasser to USAG before the reporting took place. It's just that USAG sat on that information and, and he wasn't public. Um, and Don really encouraged us and we worked together to kind of give ourselves the confidence to tell the story a little bit out of time. Um, almost like we started thinking about it as a film, almost like kind of like Syriana, where as a viewer, you're, you're sort of confused um, the first time you see things and, and then you start to put, put things together later on in the film. And Maggie's story plays like that. You see kind of a little piece of her story, then you go on with a contemporary timeline. And then later on, you see a second chapter in her story. And then you start as a viewer to, to think, oh, I get it. Here's where she fits into the timeline. 
And um, that was very exciting for us as storytellers to kind of, uh, in a way, trust the audience, you know, give them some, give the audience information, but let it hang and let the unknown kind of, um, you know, sort of hang in the air while we got on to the business of other through lines in the film. But it took us about 10 different cuts. <laughs> yeah. to get to that <laughs> we strung it out chronologically. We did it historically. We did, I mean, we did it by character. It was really tough. I think it was the hardest film we've ever structured. Was it hard to land on your ending? So, yes. Basically, think about, think about the film for a minute. Uh, I mean, the, the hardest structural piece of the film was that once you've hit the victim impact statements, which is all of the women coming forward mm -hmm. and being able to confront Larry Nasser in the courtroom, one after the other, and it's this like hugely emotional um, hit in the film. It's like, it's hard to find another, a more climactic, right. emotional climactic moment than that in the film. So where do you go from there, right? And we would look at cuts and for many, many cuts, anything that came after that felt completely useless. You weren't even listening. You had been just, you know, wrung out by the victim impact statements and it was very hard to take in any more editorial information. So, because what we really wanted to do was continue to let the legal story unfold. What was happening with the FBI? Who, had, who else had been arrested? Where were we with the Senate and the congressional hearings to make safe sport, you know, for Olympic athletes and, and the country, et cetera. All of that is incredibly important. And it's really hard to let go of that as a filmmaker, as a storyteller, because you're so immersed and it, it, every one of those details feels so important. But we realized that all viewers really need after that was to see Maggie's success story was to see her go on and become a successful NCAA athlete, reclaim her love of the sport, have a positive coaching experience, um, and start to enter young adulthood as a more full whole person, right, after this experience. And all of these other legal details and story points sort of, we sort of relegated to a much shorter, um, almost yes. like end card wrap up because yeah. emotionally we, we had to gauge the emotional hit first. That was our feeling. We, jo sorry, John, were you going to add? Oh, no, I was, I was, I was about to say pretty much the same thing that the, uh, we, uh, we, of course, all filmmakers can identify with leaving, you know, footage on the cutting room floor and how painful that is that, that last, I don't know, how long it is, several minutes section after the impact statements to the point where Maggie wins the NCAA championship. Um, the, we found ourselves, it almost felt like a little bit like jazz, like just a couple seconds of this and a couple of seconds, let's see the Indy Star wrap up. Let's see Penny go to jail. Yeah. There's a shorthand that we kind of used. Um, it was a little unusual for us. It was still storytelling, but it was, it was just like really quick little hits and again, kind of giving the audience the, the credit that they know, they know all these different things mm. um, are, 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 are sort of balls left in the air that we have to kind of button up, but we don't need to dwell on it. We don't need to spend right. 15 minutes talking about all the legal or journalistic details that went into that. We can just kind of, you know, tell the audience, yeah, that this is how this got wrapped up. This is how that got wrapped up. And then really move to this incredible redemption moment with Maggie where she wins, uh, wins the, the college championships, which is really exciting. Yeah. In an, I guess it's an alternate world now, but you know, the film would have been released in June, uh, you know, and then we would have had the 2020 Olympics in Tokyo. Talk about what it is like for you as filmmakers to have the film released in a pandemic. Cause I know like, you know, I mean, as I said before, you know, I spoke to you for Audrey Daisy and you know, it was a, you know, you did all the interviews. Um, and you know, you're out, you know, film festivals, <laughs> film festivals, <laughs> now that? everything's virtual. Remember that? Yeah. Remember that? Like when we could be in a room together, but yeah. yeah, like talk about the impact that had on the film release. It was, I mean, it's, it, been, it's like... been such a crazy 
surreal year. Uh, of course, there's been really terrible things about it. We've missed, you know, being in rooms with our colleagues and being able to share the, the really the, the number one thing was, you know, that moment where you're at a film festival and you can bring your, your, the, the people that are the stars of the film together for the first time and have that celebration, that kind of catharsis was, we really missed out on um, with the, with the um, cancellation of the live events of Tribeca. Um, but this amazing thing did happen that may not have happened, which is that the film dropped on Netflix in late June and that was it. You know, it went from <laughs> zero to 60 and in a, in, a, in a second and a half, you know, who knows how many millions of people saw it right away. And um, what we started noticing is that athletes from around the world were um, watching the film and then commenting on it um, in, in social media, in the press. We started seeing stories out of the Great Britain where uh, English athletes had said, hey, wait a minute, that, that sounds a lot like what I went through. Not necessarily the sexual abuse, but the emotional and psychological and physical abuse that they suffered. Um, Australia, Canada, there were athletes from Japan, uh, South Korea. And not just gymnasts, also across right. other sports. Yeah, this groundswell, which is actually still going on. Um, we, in the outreach for the film, we've been working with organizations to try to see if the film can play some kind of role in a supportive way of, of this thing that's going on, which is that athletes are really standing up and say, hey, wait a minute, we need to have human rights for athletes baked into the Olympic movement and baked into um, all the organizations framework for who, who you know, who, who govern, uh, you know, athletics and often are in charge of little kids who are underage. And so that's very exciting to see that there might be a glimmer of hope um, you know, of change in, in this world as well. And the Olympic Committee has an opportunity because they have a whole other year until the Olympics, right? So they can, they still have some time to amend their ways and do the right thing. And there is, and listen to their athletes who are all now standing up and speaking out, which, you know, I mean, that is, that is the power of this kind of distribution um, that, you know, we used to, we do have an impact campaign tied to the event, tied to the movie, and we're doing all sorts of really interesting and important events, but um, there's nothing like just eyeballs on the movie and the impact that that can have of people just simply seeing it, feeling moved by the story and feeling moved to want to make some change. And and we've been seeing that, so it's really exciting. Yeah, we've been doing this long enough now that, uh, uh, the Netflix of it all has been a real, I mean, this is our um, second uh, film with Netflix. And um, of course, filmmakers are, I think are all in us included are always going to want to get back to the theater and have that warm in-person experience. There's no substitute for that, but the, the reach of Netflix and the power of, of the, of the, of the um, platform is just, we've really seen a just undeniable in the case, in the case of athlete a it's, we, we can every day we we get new new news of how the knock on effect of this of this uh, story is taking place. Yeah, that's that's amazing. I mean, did your you know as people who love gymnastics and you know we all follow the Olympics, did your view change towards the sport and the Olympics? Like, I mean, sadly yes, sadly yes. I mean, we're huge. I. I grew up, I was one of those girls who entered the gym after seeing Nadia win in 1976. I mean, I go, I go way back with this and mm. my passion and love for the sport is, it's been, it's been part of my life forever. And I can't look at it the same way now because of the corruption that, and the abuse that has gone on at the expense of our most precious athletic commodities in this country, you know, I mean, uh, that, that is just reprehensible and I, I I don't feel like I can watch it the same way until some change is made and some real like a real kind of athletes manifesto is taken seriously and human rights are taken seriously um, there's too it's just been too much damage yeah. one piece of archival that we regret did not make it into the film <laughs> is that of Bonnie <laughs> As a nine-year-old gymnast with her, with her knee high with socks my tube socks on and leotard but yeah, oh my gosh. I, but what, what Bonnie is saying is, is so true. And um, 
you know, uh, maybe it's too much of a stretch metaphor, but, you know, we, I think we as Americans, I think any country is proud when they see their, um, you know, the, the best of the best athletes compete in the Olympic games. It's just an undeniable thing. I think it, it's, it's kind of like those people are showing us this, uh, potential human potential. And it, it kind of lets you kind of dream big and think about the possibilities of, of what an individual can achieve in life. And one hopeful way of looking at the story is, um, that many of these athletes did did the same thing. They they bravely stepped up and did, I think, what in past decades would have been unthinkable, which is that they fought against the system and they had a victory in in this Nasser case. Um, they did something that truly, I think, inspire continues to inspire um, people in and out of athletics with what they were able to achieve when they when they spoke up and they were persistent and they worked together and they worked with the what often takes a hit these days, but the media uh, played a really important role in this. The investigative journalism was a heroic force in the story. And so that, I think, it, as much as we, I think, soured on the Olympic movement, so to speak, our respect for the athletes themselves really um, yeah, grew, grew and, and that they were doing something that was brave outside their comfort zone. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's it. You know, it's a testament to their bravery and, you know, I think I, I don't even know how we top that, but you know, on that note, <laughs> Bonnie Cohn, John Shank, thank you so much for that incredible conversation. And thank you to the IDA and for everybody for tuning in today. Yes, thank you, you, Jazz, you Jazz, and thank you to the IDA. You. And you can watch Athlete A on Netflix globally. <laughs>